uh, 1230. Uh, thank you all for attending. Um, uh, we really appreciate your uh, presence, uh, especially, um, you know, obviously under all of the COVID uh, restrictions. And in some ways there is um, an added, or for this um, gathering, it was an added challenge in that, as you know, all the students uh, left campus. And so we have our uh, international student here, Leah Anasato, who is our co-facilitator. Co She's actually back in Japan and it's 2.30 in the morning in Japan. So I really appreciate her commitment to uh, this process. She's uh, co-facilitated co all of our uh, gatherings, gatherings and I wish there were more credit I could give her for that commitment, but except for saying as much uh, now, um, again, just thank you very much for, for committing to the process, Leah. Um, today we, yes, okay. <laughs> um, today joining us also is uh, uh, Kim Isaac DeBarrows, um, same last name, we're, we're related um, through marriage. <laughs> um, so, uh, and Kim was uh, particularly interested in today's talk in large part, um, uh, not necessarily because of the Shakespeare element, but because uh, she uh, has a PhD in counseling psychology and um, her specific uh, focus is uh, multicultural counseling. So she was really interested in joining us just to uh, see what we're saying about um, Othello in the tragedy of racial self-hatred and to perhaps help us um, develop uh, a, an understanding or appreciation for the way in which these issues continue to resonate within our society. So what we will do as we, uh, as we uh, normally do is um, I will read the description just to kind of create a context for us. And then uh, Leah will do most of the heavy lifting in terms of the analysis, but I will chime in on occasion just to um, emphasize whatever points. And, um, and I will actually uh, read uh, Othello's, Othello's lines as well, but Leah will uh, take up Iago. And I think that's uh, a majority of the, of the passages or the lines that we'll have today, okay? And then so while we're reading, we will also uh, attempt to raise the kinds of questions that resonate in our time um, in ways, in other words, very uh, meaningful, uh, relevant uh, to us. Um, and then at the end, we'll ask again, some of those questions to open, up, to open it up to a general discussion. So with that, um, I'll read the, the description. Here's the tragic and all too familiar story. A black man develops a set of highly specialized skills valuable to a racist white world. And although for, his, for its survival, that world has no choice but to acknowledge his merit and allow his elevation, it also never stops reminding him that he will never really belong. That its members will always on some level continue to misconstrue him as an unnatural, ugly, scary, and potentially dangerous outsider. In fact, some of its members, its most unimpressive and insecure ones, will even pretend to love him and be his friend just to trigger the internalized set of insecurities and insecurity and, and inferior, inferiority that he has worked so hard and continuously to resist. However, under the pressure of such complex and persistent abuse, it is only a matter of time before he tragically accepts those negative views and plays the destructive and self-destructive role that the racist white world ultimately needs him to play. This month's gathering will focus on the pivotal, pivotal passage in Othello or Shakespeare's version of this story when Iago first tricks Othello into doubting the legitimacy or naturalness of Desdemona's love for him. In the process of close reading this passage, attending specifically to Shakespeare's complex and tragic representation of Iago's racist hatred and Othello's racial self-hatred, we will do our best to identify examples of both in our world. And as always, we will also do our best to imagine or develop strategies for protecting ourselves from the type of people representing the type of world that destroys Othello. So with that, if, uh, Leah would like to start us off in our close reading, our analysis of this scene. As always, thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to read um, Shakespeare and discuss it with everybody. And um, without further ado, let's go. Iago. Good name in man and woman, dear my lord 
is the immediate jewel of their souls. Right off the bat, we know that good name is very important. We see that good name, which a good name is basically a reputation in a society. And Iago links it as the jewel of your soul, as the what represents your soul. I think this is very pivotal. Like we're materializing our soul as a reputation. Who steals my purse steals trash. Tis something, nothing. Twas mine, tis this, and has been slaved to thousands. But he that filches from my good name robs me of that which enriches him and makes me poor indeed. Iago is lifting up this idea of reputation and a good name to be more important than money, to be of more value than money in his society. And I think we should question whether that's the same in our society today. Is reputation important? To, reputation is always important, but how important it is, is it in our society today? What does it change? And is it more important than money? And, and if I could jump in, it's as, as you're saying, how is uh, a reputation um, defined? What does a reputation mean? And I think as importantly, more importantly, perhaps, is how do we how do we measure it? How do we define it? How do we how do we see it? Right. And that's so it's in some ways it's a little ironic that we have Iago uh, talking about a good name is more important than wealth, but then he defines it in terms of wealth, right? It is the immediate jewel of their souls. So that which is often, as we'll see, that which is, is often um, invisible, that within, whether it's a soul, a good name, is something that this society has to visualize, has to materialize. And as we'll see, that's in, in some ways the basis upon which he's um, working on Othello. So by heavens, and it, I'm up, right, Leah? By heaven, I'll know thy thoughts, right? And that's Othello, he's, he's reflecting the frustration about a society that so values material wealth and what we can see. And think about the relationship of that to um, racial difference, the visible versus the internal. I also think that Othello's desire to know Iago's thoughts represent shows how much opinion matters and how much what other people think of you matters and when and people have power over you when you care what they think of you. Iago, you cannot if my heart were in your hands, nor shall not whilst tis in my custody. Once again, there's this idea of heart and soul, something that's within you being something that is represented outside as your reputation and your name. Um, and that we use these to define us, to define our souls and our heart. We use what people think of us to define them. So Othello responds, ha, huh. I'm not sure what that means, <laughs> but we'll move on. Ha, huh. go ahead. Oh, beware my Lord of jealousy. This is the first instance we see jealousy come up, but it's going to be pivotal throughout this reading. Um, and I think that, first of all, jealousy is born out of a dissatisfaction with yourself or an insecurity of yourself. And it's, it's like comparing yourself to others is what it is born out of, too. Um, it is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on, that cuckold lives in bliss, who certain of his hate, of his fate, loves not his wronger. One thing that we notice here is that, in in the case of a cuckold, the both part the party both parties know that one is going behind their back in the relationship, or is cheating. There's a mistress or whatever. Somebody knows, um, and Iago is hinting in his following lines. But oh, what! Damn, my newts tells he over who dotes yet doubts, suspects yet fondly loves. Iago is saying that it's worse to not know, but to doubt the love. To doubt, but still love. To be suspect.
expecting, but still loving them, not know for sure. Right. This and causes jealousy. Say, say again, Leah? This causes jealousy. This is what um, gives birth. And just to, to connect a, a bit to what, uh, what we've already said about, about good name, uh, reputation defined in terms of, let's say, external material objects, jealousy itself um, is connected to that in that uh, a man objectifying or a woman defined as an, an object of value for a man. So that the root of jealousy is also this kind of this need to objectify those things that aren't are easily or reliably objectified. Oh, mercy. Poor and content is rich and rich enough. Once again, we're seeing this idea of wealth. We're relating reputation, jealousy, emotions to wealth. We're equating them and quantifying them as well. But riches find this is as poor as winter. To him that ever fears, he shall be poor. Good God, the souls of all my tribe defend from jealousy. What's really interesting here is that Iago is calling on the souls of his tribe, setting up this tribe, this sense of tribalism and the sense of his people, his um, relatives or people that he belongs to, which kind of sets him up as other than Othello. And he's just introducing this idea of their differences. And, and then linking that to defending him from jealousy. Right. So then he continues. Othello responds, "Why? Yeah. Why is why is this? Um, Thinks thou I I'd make a life of jealousy?" And I think what Othello is missing there is that Iago isn't necessarily including him in the tribe. He's assuming a kind of inclusion, and, and Iago is in the process of playing on his outsider status, that he is, in, he is excluded. To follow still the changes of the moon with fresh suspicion. No, to be once in doubt is, is once to be resolved, right? And that's the certainty that Othello, because of the insecurity, his insecurities, uh, the vulnerabilities in the society, he wants certainty. That is the way one appears is the way one is, but in a racist, in a, in a racist society, it all depends on how those appearances are, are read. So then he goes on to, uh, he, he goes on, tis not to make me jealous, to say my wife is fair, feeds well, loves company, is free of speech, sings, plays, and dances well. Where virtue is, these are more virtuous. Um, that is, I think, an interesting defense of a well-educated, liberated uh, woman. And it's precisely the kinds of qualities that, qualities that empowered Desdemona to go against her social norms to marry him. Nor from my, so, so, so where virtue is, there are, there, uh, these are more virtuous. Nor from mine own weak merits will I draw the smallest fear or doubt of her revolt, for she had eyes and chose me. So that is interestingly his first his first clear admission of this, this sense of inferiority, right? That he's saying in that instance that, that his merits were weak. How much more meritorious could you be than to be a general, a highly valued mm -hmm. and sought after general in a society? But he still feels himself weak and that weakness um, is all about the way he, uh, he's, his appearance is perceived and he suggests that uh, the smallest fears or, or, or doubt, uh, smallest fear or doubt of her revolt, for she had eyes. So she has eyes. She's seeing, but how is she seeing? And chose me. Othello uh, or uh, Iago's job is to make him question how, or how precisely Desdemona saw him. No, Iago, I'll see before I doubt. So there's that that attention to really an upset obsession with seeing and how we see. I'll see before I doubt, when I doubt prove. And on the proof, there is no more but thus, a way at once with love and jealousy. Just note like how one is seen is really linked to your reputation and 
how people perceive you is basically your reputation. And so it's not just about how you look and how Desdemona sees him, but it's also, this is also all about his reputation and how everybody sees him because Desdemona chose him. And so it's this huge, more than just his relationship with her, but this is him starting to question everything. I'm glad of this, for now I shall have reason to show the love and duty that I bear you with franker spirit. What Iago is actually glad of is that he's noticed that, well, he's, no, he's been able to get Othello to admit to a weakness. And yet he is kind of masking this with this love. And what we have to be aware of is that when, it, when in a society where there are, where there is racism, um, the superior, the ones who have the privilege are always suspect when they claim to be doing something out of love or duty and that that claim isn't enough. We always have to be suspicious of it. I think, I think uh, Leah, when we, um, and we didn't have a whole lot of time to, um, to, to really uh, to read and, and prep for this. So it's kind of, it's enjoyable that we're still in the process of, of, of doing so, but you were really in some ways fascinated by, I don't want to say, even to the point of tickled by uh, just how, how deceptive and devious Iago yeah. is, right? And he is precisely the kind of character that would, um, that would, uh, that should make us uh, very, in some ways, suspicious uh, as we navigate a world defined in, in, in a lot of ways by corruption. In this instance, it's based on this racial, uh, this, the, this uh, racist hatred but just in the, let's say the political world, right? We can't just be so trusting of anyone, but especially those who go out of their way to declare their love and support of us. As outsiders reading, we see how suspicious Iago seems, but we can also see how completely he's playing Othello. He's, right. he's got Othello right where he wants him to be, and that's scary. Right. Therefore, as I am bound, receive it from me. I speak not yet of proof. Look to your wife. Observe her well with Cassio. Where your and, eyes... Oh, just if I could interrupt, look, observe. So that attention to looking. Continued on where your eyes thus. Right. Not jealous nor secure. I would not have your free and noble nature out of self-bounty be abused. And I think when he refers to Othello's nature, he's kind of defining Othello in this part. And so we, always, we can already see him like giving these labels to Othello mm -hmm. and playing with that. Look but, but, also, but, but also that the free, the free and noble um, nature, let me find that again. Um, Right, I would not have your free and noble nature. And that's precisely in some ways the problem in a, a society where everyone is hiding their true feelings or attention, intentions, right? And Othello is the one who is just open. That's not a good strategy to protect oneself, to, to survive and to thrive within a corrupt world. Look to it. I know our disposition well. Once again, we see that tribalism we see Iago naming his he calls it our country disposition well our country disposition well but there's this sense of separation this sense of he knows it but implying that Othello doesn't really know it um, and there's just this this idea of majority versus minority she did deceive her father marrying you and when she seemed to shake and fear your looks, she loved them most. So this is saying that Desdemona found Othello's looks to be almost disturbing or unsettling and different. But despite, and I think the word despite is so important, but despite that, despite his color, his looks, she loved him still, or she loved him most because of that. And that's sending this image of these contingencies to her love. Mm. And, and I think it's, uh, it 
for, she becomes she becomes in that instance in that description is a, a complex character, right? It's not a simple matter of her easily looking past her her society's racism, right? That it is a struggle for her to do so, right? So um, so despite her progressive actions, she is not without or beyond a negative view of blackness. So even if we think about, um, let's say, a progressive-minded white person, it's not as if we could make the assumption that that progressive-minded uh, white person is without, is ever without racial bias. And did you finish uh, that, Leah? Yes. Yes. Um, and then Othello responds, and so she did. Ah. Right, he's focusing on that now. What does it mean that she, she found his appearance disturbing, frightening? Why go to then? He that so young could give out such a seeming to seal her father's up, seal her father's eyes up close as oak. There's this idea that her father had to have his eyes closed up for it to be accepted, for their love or that their love and their marriage was so unnatural or wrong that she had to close up her eyes, close up her father's eyes. He thought was witchcraft. It had to be witchcraft to be real. It couldn't be real. It had to have something going on behind. It's just questioning the legitimacy of the love. But I am much to blame. I humbly do beseech you of your pardon for too much loving you. You just see that again, the whole claim, the declarations of love, it's over the top. And it's, it's this, it's a declaration of love that's actually exploitation. And that we have to find ways to become aware of that in a society, in, in every society. Right. I am bound to thee um, forever. Eric and Leah, this is Kelly. Sorry, I don't have my laptop with me and my computer doesn't have a webcam. Um, so I'm talking on my phone, but I was just wondering for a second, I was really struck rereading this by the seal his eyes up like oak. Uh -huh. And it's a very poetic phrase. And I was just, but I hadn't heard it before and so I was just wondering I don't want us to get off of the main topic but I just was wondering if either of you knew a little bit more about that phrase well let, let us finish um let us finish the reading and then we'll come back to that question okay awesome so uh wh where were we uh Leah uh, I think I think you just read I, I am bound to thee forever so I think it's me right right I see this half a little dashed your spirits. Not a jot, not a jot. I think Othello's putting up a really tough facade here. He's acting like it's not bothering him at all, but throughout this we can see that he's been admitting to his weaknesses and to that fact that Desdemona did choose him for or despite his looks. Mm -hmm. A faith I fear it has. I hope you will consider what is spoke comes from my love. Once again, the, this focus on his love, he's doing this out of care, but I do see your mood. I am to pray you not to strain my speech to greater issues, not to longer reach than suspicion. I will not. Oh, did you want to comment on that, Leah? Uh, just like to say that the idea of suspicion and jealousy, those are linked together. Again, the doubting and suspicion right. of is what leads to jealousy. I will not. I do not think, but Desdemona is honest. Long live she so, and long live you to think so. This phrase almost sounds well-meaning and innocent, but if you really think about it, he's yeah, I was really, I use this word throwing shade, but I feel like he's, he's just actually insulting Othello and belittling him as well as like looking down on him because 
long live you to think so. And so, and so, so Le Leah, for the older folks in the audience, could you explain the shade uh, uh, description? Shade is basically, it's actually um, originated out of drag culture, but it's um, this idea of insulting someone in a way or somehow making fun of someone in a way that is somehow still seen as innocent, somehow still mm -hmm. um, acceptable. Like you can say it without being coming across as too rude. You can mm -hmm. do it because it's somehow just just for fun. You're not really meaning right, to hurt. Right. But and, it and, is we're, and, and we're working through that. It's like how do we how, how do we describe just the complexity of what. Um, Iago was doing, right? This complex strategy. And I think the, the extent to which it, it, it intrigues and even tickles us is a reflection of how much we understand it is, is so much a part of the way we navigate and negotiate with each other in, in our society. Um, so, so then Othello responds, and this is really the pivotal point that uh, captures uh, for me this, this sense of self-hatred is when he says, and yet how nature Airing from it, airing from itself, and then Iago jumps on that. I, there's the point as to be bold with you, not to affect many proposed matches of her own clime, complexion, and degree. There's this idea that this Demona should have gone with somebody of a different clime, complexion, and degree of her climb, complexion and degree, right? It's back to that, that notion of tribe, right? Of, of, and I think you, you described it as group or family even, right? Um, and he's out, so it's a way of, of, of highlighting Othello's outsider status. And that it's somehow, that what they are doing is unnatural. Right. Where to, where to we see in all things nature trends for one, may smell in such a will most rank foul disproportion thoughts and natural. But pardon me, I do not in a position distinctly speak of her. We clearly see that he does distinctly mm -hmm. speak of her. Though I may fear her will, recoiling to her better judgment, may fall to match you with her country forms and happily repent. He's saying that in the end, eventually, there's a great possibility that she's going to realize that she doesn't belong with you because this is unnatural. She belongs with her own people. And he's just furthering this idea of this difference between Othello and Desdemona and saying that this isn't natural or right. It's not going to last. Right. Thank you for that, uh, Leah. Now, do, do you have any questions you'd like to... Uh share with the group or just open up to, to the group? I have a couple, but I think um, one of the things that we really notice here is just this idea of reputation. And I think this comes in a couple different ways. One, it's like, how, how important is reputation in our society? Because clearly the good name is more than money in this society. And also like, and here, Iago is defining the soul and the heart with reputation and the good name. Like how people perceive you is becoming the externalization of what's internal. And I have, I have a, a, a perhaps a, a way of a way of uh, a way of developing that. Um, mm -hmm. How much is reputation on some level always about? appearance mm. right and in that that's the the problem it's 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 if we're if we're making judgments about how someone looks through the lens the lens of a racist um society it's like so how, how much for as much as we might tell ourselves otherwise um when we uh, develop an opinion of so much of someone how much of that is really about uh, the negative ways in which we've been socialized just to judge someone. And I think one that we can 
define someone or define someone so not by their appearances are there ways that we can can we completely uh, separate that right and i think a version of that and i jotted that uh, this down and then we can open up if you'd like uh brandon you could um stop sharing the screen we could just go back to the the um the you know just a regular gallery view um how do we guard against as, as and this was on like that second page that i jotted this down how do we guard how do we guard against making racist sexist assumptions in a visually and materially oriented racist world so how do we guard against that um was there another question so that's uh two was there another question you had uh leah just one more that i thought was really interesting would be um how does social media um, specifically internalize or represent racism and and like how does it fuel so race uh, racial self hatred through being so focused on reputation and appearances, appearances and yeah. and like how things look in images it's all about the image in a social media account and I think that that really is a huge source of self hatred especially in today's yeah age and that how how can we one combat that and how do we see that today and i think that just just to, just to um um continue with that it's the way uh social media and its emphasis on fragmented thoughts and images it's actually it's actually intensifying and perpetuating uh the problems around race and and gender you know, just, just to identify the two categories that are central to the discussion today. And there's one so, final um, kind of based on how do we protect ourselves from exhaustion or the, the toil that comes from mm -hmm. both self-hatred and fighting against self-hatred. Right. That and when you're in a world where you have these negative images perpetually, um, you know, projected, right? That you're, you're, you're always defending yourself against those, those negative assumptions about uh, what does it mean to be black? I think that in one of, I think it was in our first gathering, you talked about just the way as a biracial, um, as a biracial uh, woman that is, um, as Japanese and white American, right? How you're read and in some ways, stereotypical ways in the American context and in the Japanese context. And so that it puts you in this position of perpetually um, guarding yourself against that or disabusing people of those stereotypes. And it's, 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 it's exhausting. So how, so, so how, as you're saying, how do we guard ourselves against how do we protect ourselves from just the exhaustion of, of, of navigating um, a, a racist society? So we're done. <laughs> so we'd like to um, uh, open it up to the, to the group. Uh, Martha. Hi, um, I was thinking, you know, poor Othello's all alone. And I wish she had the benefit of something like the advice column in the, no the novel Americana, where I don't know how many of you have read it, but um, Adichie teaches non-American Blacks how to exist in America. Mm. And, you know, to so say when, you know, jealous white people profess to be on your side, be a little bit suspicious. He has no, I mean, his only, loyal person is not black, Cassio. And he yeah. doesn't know that he's being played either. So, right. you know, to be all alone as the only one like him and judge and have nobody to tell you, how do you know your self-worth and how do you know how what to be suspicious of? Right. Yeah. I think it's interesting that you raised the uh, uh, Cassio is is as well and that um, there are levels of of outsiderness because Cassio is himself an outsider. 
Um, but this goes back to, to uh, what Leah and I emphasize about just uh, Iago's emphasis on, on the tribe, the, the, you know, the, the, um, the in-group, right? That Othello is completely alone in this world. And in oh, some no. ways... Go ahead, sorry. No, no, it's alone in this world. And, and in some way, um, that is, continues to be the, the cost of success in a white world, right? That seldom will you find a situation where there's a critical mass of black success. It's usually one at a time. Yeah. And then there's the whole sexualized fear early in the play where they're like that terrible comment about the black ram and the white view, you know, that that existed then. And, you know, that was the cause of all the J Jim Crow horror. And even today, I think, um, you know, there there's a, I mean, she, where she says, um, where he says um, in your passage, she was, she seemed to shake and fear your looks and it was kind of exciting. And was this some kind of exotic adventure? You know, it's, right. it's very current. It's taboo, right? Can I just say, say something uh, just for a minute that, is that um, we don't actually know anything about how Desdemona feels. All we know is what Iago is saying, right? And right. Iago is a liar. So he's right. not, he could well be lying. How would he know what Des Desdemona really feels? But mm -hmm. he's playing on, um, he's playing on cultural ideas. And we don't know that in, in that society, reputation is more worth more than money. That's what he's using to, to, to trick Othello. So, you know, I just want to, you know, it's, it's Iago here who we're learning about. We're not learning about Desdemona as far as I'm concerned. As far as I know, right? But but it's interesting that we're we're learning about her reaction that Othello seems to confirm, mm -hmm. right? But he but 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 he is he's 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 grown up in that society too. So I don't I don't I don't know. I mean, I just it, I'm always suspicious. Well, and and maybe more in real world than in literature, when two people are interpreting another person's behavior. Right. And they're right. both men, and they're interpreting this woman. And right. I'd rather hear from that woman than exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 and it's it's that obsession as we're talking about with the superficiality of reputation. So they just focused on her her appearance, right, as an object. And it's like so. The, what's frustrating about this this play, and I think this is what you're getting at, Ruth, is why didn't he just talk to her? <laughs> you know, um, he 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 he, uh, he talks about. Uh, just how how well educated in in um, in in open open she is in public even that she speaks well I think as he said and these aren't bad things but it's uh, it's it's as if Iago drags him into seeing them as bad or at least insignificant things enough just to read her appearance in a specific way. May I? So, go, yes, Manuela. So I, I was thinking, speaking to both Ruth's point and your point, what, uh, what's so um, wonderful about this uh, passage is the extent to which Iago can play Othello, Othello on his expectations of women anyway. He has just spoken of how in Venice, women just care about the appearance. And, 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 and here he is, quote unquote, proving that Desdemona is deceitful by telling him she hid her attraction to you from her father. He thought it was magic because he never saw it coming. Mm. She pretended to not care for you, to fear you, to deceive him. So he's just proven to him that she is deceitful. Right. And, and, and of course he will not talk to her because Iago is, is first proving that she's deceitful by reminding him that she deceived her father, one so young, he says, and she could deceive so well. And then he is also exploiting his fear of being absolutely alone, that he does not belong, yeah. and so he can't even talk to her. He, yeah. he, cannot, he cannot disprove this proof because he is alone. And Desdemona 
has seen him and loved him, but what if that was also performance, like she performed for her father? So, so he's been totally severed from any capacity yeah. to judge, you know, rationally or, or, or reassure himself with verification of the truth. So it's, I don't know. It's fascinating. It's a moment of such agony for, you know, for a yeah. reader seeing how right, it's right. And so one of the things that I, I thought of um, as I was listening is, so we're talking about him as a general um, and in this society inside or outside a group. And he's struggling with a real, what I would call an imposter syndrome. So... Oh. He doesn't see himself, despite his incredible success in the ranks of the military, that he's a general. How, how, how much higher can you go? Um, so this really seeps into what um, Iago is, is, is kind of playing with him. Um, you don't belong. All these doubts that he already has about being in this rank, in this space. Um, it, we call it, it's, it's a real cognitive issue. Um, something we call it stinking thinking. So you are, despite all of these good things around you, you, you're doing yourself in. So your self-worth is, is suffering. Um, it's, it's really pulling you down that you really can't thrive in a space where you're alone. And I thought that this, the, the word of being unnatural, that the relationship is being characterized as being an unnatural one and what that means to him. I think, and going back, yeah. oh, sorry. Hey, Charlotte. Yeah, <laughs> hello everyone. Um, no. And I think going back to um, what Leah mentioned about throwing shade at some portion of the, um, reading, I think that it also connects back, the entire reading connects back to another social media idea of gaslighting. And that is uh, when you manipulate someone's thoughts into believing a certain, a certain thing that they experience is actually false. And it's considered abuse. It's something that is intentional yeah. and it's considered a form of uh, intimidation. So we see uh, Othello, uh, go through this whole process of being gaslighted um, by Iago. And so for me, the one phrase that keeps on popping up in terms of how to shield oneself from all of the bombardments that we, mm -hmm. we receive from social media and from the media um, mm -hmm. would be a line that Othello mentioned, which is where your eyes. And so where your eyes indicating that it's your frame of seeing or your frame of viewing or of understanding must always um, be on. You always have to have it on. You cannot take it off at any point in time or else you will face the very thing that he says, which I think Kelly mentioned is closing your eyes, uh, closing uh, your eyes like oak, like having your eyes shut as tightly as oak. So wearing your eyes is a way to prevent yourself from having your eyes wow. tightly shut as Oh. Right. <clears throat> right. It, it feels to me, and just, just from what everyone is saying, that um, um, but by training, I'm, I'm, I'm suspicious of, of essentialism, right? That there, is, um, um, that there is an essence to anything, that, that basically things are, mat are, are a matter of linguistic social constructions, right? Um, and that's in, in some ways that that's that's uh, uh, an effective or product a potentially productive orientation to uh, a text that's all about reputation, right? Uh, reputation, social rank, identity, um, wealth as measure of one's one's uh, one's character. Um, as Kim identified with uh, with the, the status of a general, he's a general. How much higher can you get? But if if that is pretty much the sum total of, of who you are in a society that still questions your status within that society, within that society, there is that that perpetual sense or need for something more. And in that way, I feel as if this is a this is a place so desperate for um, a, 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 a self, uh, you know, a self, the soul, the heart, apart from society, um, in 
we don't get it. Obviously, it ends tragically. Um, but I think that if he, in the frustration of, uh, of the play, that the possibility for that would have been for him to engage in an, in an honest conversation with his wife. But I think that he is such the accumulation of these stories that, that may not even be true, um, that, that it raises questions about whether there, he has a soul or a heart defined or whether he's, in, he's, he's uh, looked within enough, right? W within the society to identify who he is or in quotations, who he really, really is because the extent to which he buys into this society defining him in a cer certain way, he will always be inadequate or inferior. Uh, yeah. Yes. Can I just tell you, chime into it? It's interesting how Iago's the op polar opposite of that. I mean, Othello, through this um, reading, there's so many places where we can see his insecurity, see where he has to prove himself, see where he affirms that he doesn't fit or belong. And everything Iago says is just taken at face value. He's honest Iago, honest Iago, <laughs> all the way right. through. And, you know, no one thinks to question that at all. And to, right. you know, to explicitly see that he gets that as part of his whiteness, as part of his privilege, that there's nothing he has to prove. His mm -hmm. reputation, although he's completely unworthy of it, is there's nothing, you know, tangible to even question, whereas Othello is the, is the complete opposite there. So... Um, I think that forms an interesting contrast. But. Right. Yeah. If I could just jump in here um, quickly, you know, um, with, in, with respect to that, but I think also with respect to what Kim was pointing out about rank here, one of the things that I found really fascinating and which is connected to, but sort of parallel to the whole sort of theme of reputation is the whole sort of metaphor of bondage and freedom it goes on here and it's, it's, I mean, it's a whole sort of performance, right? Where Iago comes in as the lieutenant and says, I am duty bound to you and you have this free and open nature. And he encourages, you know, Othello to exercise his agency, all with the result that at the end, Othello says, uh, you know, I am bound to you, right? I mean, that, right. those, you know, um, um, I mean, he's, he's actually performing, Iago is asking him to perform freedom so as to really enslave him metaphorically. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I just found that the, the, the complex chain of metaphors around bondage uh, just really, really resonant here. I mean, particularly, obviously, in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the racial difference, the whole sort of context of slavery. Right. Because, I mean, there's so many mentions, you know, sort of offhand mentions of slavery in the right. play, right? So, but I just, uh, I had to mention that because it just, it, it really popped out at me. And I think it's, it does play along with the, uh, the whole sort of, you know, sense that he can't find himself. I mean, he's the general, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but in the end, he has to say he's bound to his lieutenant. I mean, come on. You know? Right. Okay. Oh, yes. Sorry, this is Kelly here. Oh, I don't want to jump over for somebody. Um, I was also was thinking about uh, what Laura said and this idea of what we get bound to and um, social media. And um, I recently read The Art of Doing Nothing and how they talk about it. But now, just like in here, how Iago is saying um, your reputation, this intangible, is your most important asset that nowadays our most valuable asset is our attention and what we mm -hmm. turn it to or what it's not. That is what's been commodified um, because obviously when we're on social media, that means we're being exposed to ads. Um, and that so and that one of the most powerful acts we can do is to actually trace where are we, how are we giving away our attention to others and how and when we give away attention that, yeah, we become subdued by these people or we let their ideas start creeping in or how um, my sister works in PR and um, she says that, you know, within PR, it's well known that the key emotion, the primary emotion that Instagram elicits in people is envy wow. when polled. 
It's like, that's it. It's envy. And, and everyone in PR knows it, and they have to think about this and the double-edged sword of places like Instagram um, when putting, like, trying to sell your product in a positive way. And yet also you need to work within a system that is built around envy. And it seems like this, too, of social media and where we give our attention. And again, like Iago is pushing him away from giving his attention to the realities of his wife even though they're complicated realities, right? Um, they're not, it's not easy and clear cut, like she loves me no matter what, but that instead to start thinking of these intangibles of like, what do others think of you? What does this happening? These intangibles that pull, as you said, Eric, start fracturing our attention and therefore start letting all these, all these doubts start creeping in, right? Right. And, and it's, so in what, I think Kelly, what you're what you're um, in part identifying is that um, it's just, and I think we've all in some way that that, that this is a this is this is in some ways obviously a a, a, a competitive male dominated society. So just from the perspective of someone like I Iago, when you have these outsiders in Cassio and uh, in Othello coming in, so his mission is to tr how do we? Um, so in some ways, Laura, it's it's his his. His 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 white he's playing on his white privilege right to in some ways try to try to protect or guard or reclaim um, the privilege that he once experienced as a Venetian man mm -hmm. right and so it's it's the way race trumps that that uh, that national that national distinction to try to to, to try to recover um, the privilege attached to that that uh, that um, that national uh, position or, or, or identity. So I think that it's, that, so to, to focus as Kelly is focusing on or to identify envy, this is an incredibly, Othello as our own society, is an incredibly envious and competitive society. And the interesting thing about our society played out as it is on so much of it on social media, it's, it's, it's so much of it is just, is just images, right? It's virtual. <laughs> Um, so what is in the final analysis, what is, what is real? That's always my, my matrix reference. Um, uh, what is real? And it, and it seems to me Othello and saying, you know, in, in needing him to be honest, Iago, right? He has to believe that because this is a world where everything is about this competition or this, this, this competitive, this competitive mediation or the representation of of uh, the rep representation of a reputation, right? Representation of a reputation, of a good name. And so social media, I think uh, it's, it has the, the, a similar, if not um, for us, an intensified uh, effect um, that it's just about appearances. And that's the, the accumulation of, um, of, of status. It's, is it real? And I think that the, that the play is, is desperate for something real. And I think Othello had the closest thing to something real in his relationship with uh, with Desdemona, um, but he is so defined by that superficiality, that materialism, that that uh, competition. Right. So I think in terms of competition or the um, his again the self worth going back to what he is worth and how he assesses himself um, in in comparison to or related to the persistent nature of others as we see in social media or the way that Iago persistently um, trick, trickily um, was trying to undermine him and establish that doubt. And so one of the questions that Leah, you posed um, very, very early on, um, thinking about how do we guard ourselves against um, such persistence um, and such damage to um, what we consider our self-worth and who we are, our self-esteem. And a lot of that, um, I think Martha had mentioned some of that too, like, I think it was Martha, being alone. Like, how do you um, deal with success? How do you deal with marriage? How do you deal with friends, colleagues, Instagram and the like um, while you're alone. And so a lot of that has to do with you creating some of your own um, support system. So what are the protective factors? How do you protect yourself against all of this that's going on um, 
around you. And so, you know, I think in terms, a lot of the, a lot of us kind of get some of that from our families kind of saying, well, this is, this is who you are. This is how you establish yourself. These, this is who we are. And these are, we are proud people that you're coming from. So helping you to establish that. And then as you grow or as you establish yourself professionally, um, then you then choosing some people, hopefully not like Iago, but choosing some people to help you um, go through life without being so lonely and establishing some more positive um, supports. But you have to really start sort of tapping into some of those strengths and then your ability to cope and um, sort of the establish, further establish your self-esteem, because that's something that it's not already there. It's something that we have to work on every, every day um, in all the relationships that we have in our lives. I think one real world point is that Othello is Iago's boss, kind of tying to Kim's point. Here's this workplace and here's this other, you know, Iago's black boss. Um, and so how, how does Othello um, make sure that his, the people who are supposed to be supporting him, particularly as a general in war, where you need loyalty from your troops, right. are right. actually on your team. Um, and he, he, you know, he, he wasn't able to do that, which is part of the tragedy. Um, He's far from home, you know, he doesn't have his people. His people are Moorish, back, presumably back in Africa, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're right. The one person who could have backed him up and everything she says directly does sound like she loves him and is loyal to him to the end. Um, but he doesn't, that doesn't help him in the workplace. You know, just just uh, I guess just to provide a, a little context. Um, the only thing, um, or I'll just say, one of the only things things we know about his background is in the story about the handkerchief exchange between his mother, his mother, and, uh, yeah. his mother and father. And um, there's an inconsistency in that story, okay. right? So it raises the questions about whether or not. Um, he's honest with himself and certainly with Desdemona about his own past. So I would say, and of course, I don't, uh, not from a, from a psychological per, uh, perspective, um, but, um, you know, we have to be honest with ourselves as well, right? And I think that there's, uh, there's a level in his storytelling, there's a, a level of hyperbole and dishonesty. And that's in some ways a, re a reflection of his insecurity within this world. He needed that to be successful as a glorious general. But we have to also, I think, be okay without the exaggeration. <laughs> right? Because that's that exaggeration is a reflection. It, it, he's trying to compensate for those, for his isolation and in all of the kind of the racist assumptions around him or that, that define him. That you know that you're in the world, but not of the world, right? You're not of that world. You're you're protecting, how do we protect ourselves within, within that world? And I think in an interesting way with, with the two minutes we have left, I think one of the reasons Leo found, finds Iago uh, 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 so intriguing is that in some ways he's connected to Desdemona, remember? She had to withhold her feelings from her father. So it can be a positive strategy of advancing oneself in a racist, sexist, corrupt world. Um, so we can't be as open as Othello in that world. So we have to be very careful, very strategic about the way we find or make those connections, form those connections, that support group or that family. Um, so she is, she provides all of the answers in her conduct, right? And in uh, the potential of Othello just to reach out to her, to connect, to have an actual honest conversation uh, with her. The, the, the tragedy is that his racial self-hatred, defined as it is within a society, prevents him from doing that. He did make one positive move in 
um, taking Cassio over Iago. I mean, I think that's true. They say one of the pieces that Iago is so jealous of is he was passed over for a promotion, not to get so corporate. But in right. putting <laughs> the right people in the right positions, he did one thing well in picking Cassio. Right. So we're we're out of time. Um, any parting comments? Fun. Okay. Oh. Uh, I have one. Oh, sorry, Eric. I have one. This is Kelly. Oh man, I wish I could have gone to all of these. Um, my last comment was, you know, thinking about the flip side of, right, as people of color try to think of how to deal, how to move through safely through racist systems, is how do white people work to dismantle these systems, right, so that they people don't have to constantly be on the defense. <laughs> Um, and was just thinking the um, uh, the argument that Iago insinuates this um, what is natural is for two white people to be together, for instance, right? Like should be with like. And I was just thinking about how um, since I've moved to Norfolk, actually, I have heard this argument and I'd never heard it before um, in other parts of the U.S. The other parts of the U.S., the racism, the flavor is different where I lived, <laughs> but that once again, is this way of thinking, like for me as a white person to be like, oh, I really need to like confront the insidio insidious ways that this shows up um, in white only spaces, right? And like, even when there's sometimes tiny, small things like in my neighborhood association and where they're like, some people, we don't like fishing on our block, but it's like, you know, the people who go fishing are black consistently, right? Like there's like, there's these, all these tiny little ways that since I've moved here, people will say like, well, we just like to be among people like ourselves, which I'd never heard till I moved here. And I didn't know what that meant, or we don't want traffic from outside the neighborhood, which I didn't know what that meant. Like there are all these things that I've heard since I moved here that I've never, I, it's taken me a while to even figure out what it meant, but that it's this same insidious insidious way of not coming out and saying black people and white people should be in separate spaces and i think many of the people who say this are very liberal or consider themselves progressive and would never if they followed their logic all the way they would probably be horrified at the results right. but it i guess for me it just makes me think like oh yeah i gotta even i gotta be a part of my neighborhood association even though i want nothing i who cares but apparently i need to care Right. Like I need to dismantle because otherwise somebody's going to be in there fiddling with things um, mm -hmm. that, you know, and enacting, enacting things in spaces that are my spaces, too, and everybody's spaces. Right, right. So I guess that's the flip side for me as a white person, like listening today, be like, oh, yeah, I need to get in there more. Right. And I feel like so much of the, the, the thrust of, uh, of uh, diversity and and inclusion programs is that if you find yourself um, attempting to dismantle racism in an all white space, that's part of the problem, right? Um, that these spaces need to be more inclusive. And, and in that way, my experience of Norfolk more generally has been more positive than some of the other places that I, I've lived because we have about a population of maybe 38 to 40 percent African American, right? So you have, uh, at least in the city, you have a significant representation of Black people that can't be so easily ignored. Um, this was not a possibility um, for me in upstate New York, for instance, or in, um, in parts of, of the Midwest. Um, so that when I'm hearing the, uh, the, the people in that particular association coding their racism in ways, I'm like, oh, they really have, there, there's perhaps a significant population of Black folk they're trying to deal with. I see more potential in that in the absence of Black folk and um, that is in all white spaces of some well-meaning uh, white people trying to do the right thing. Mm. Um, but but we're, we're way out of time. <laughs> um, but thanks, I just, 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 just to end, uh, thank you all for taking the time uh, to, to join us. Um, I wanna uh, thank again, Leah for co-facilitating all four of um, the, these gatherings. Hopefully I can get her to do at least a couple um, next next semester, yes. um, but it's been for me. It's been it's 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 been a pleasure, and we will continue to 
uh, do these, and we hope that you'll continue to join. Definitely be there. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Oh, good.